if you're new to Northside and maybe you decided to come today for the first time, or if perhaps you're watching online and this was the first time you decided to listen to a message and you saw the title of the sermon, or you heard Jessica's announcement, you're probably thinking of all the Sundays that we could have chosen to come and to listen. We chose today. Awkward. And I know how you feel. You know, I'm kind of like, hi, I'm Wayne. Nice to meet you. Today we're going to talk about the hyper-sexualized culture that we live in and its impact on our relationship. So I understand it's a little awkward. It's a little weird. But we've been in a series talking about transformation. We've been talking about the things that God is reconciling, changing, redeeming, where we need healing, and there is no other area that we need more help and more healing and more restoration than this one right here. If I were to put three letters up on the screen, these three letters right here, without saying a word about it, there would be an emotional, physiological, mental response that you would have to this. Why is that? Why does it immediately conjure up such strong feelings or, or emotions within us? I'll tell you why. It's because sex is the most intimate, bonding, cementing, bonding experience that God created that has a key role in making two people one. God created that for a husband and wife in a marriage relationship. It's how he created it to be this deeply bonding, intimate experience. That's how God created it. That is why it creates such a physiological, emotional response. It's because God designed it that way. He designed it to be something that impacts us deeply. And on one hand, our sexuality is an area where there can be such joy and fulfillment and beauty and climax. It's incredible. But on the other hand, our sexuality can be an area of frustration and disappointment and struggle and loss and confusion and distortion and even perversion. Why is that? Why is this area of our lives, human sexuality, so beautiful on one hand and so messed up on the other? Why is it that so many people are dealing with brokenness in their sexual relationships? Why is it that, that it can be so hard to find consistent sexual joy in marriage? Why are so many people confused about healthy sexuality or God's design for it? And why do people behave in sex, sexually in ways that actually undermine what they really desire, what they really want, what they're really after. Instead, their behavior leads to them feeling enslaved or wounded or hurt. Why is it that this is what's happening when it comes to our sexual behavior? And I'll tell you why it's happening this way. The reason we're experiencing this, this struggle so much, is that Satan knows that if he can wound a man or wound a woman, sexually, then he wounds them deeply. If he can wound them in that way, he can wound them to the deepest parts of their being. That is why Satan has purposefully distorted or perverted sex in every generation and every culture that has ever lived. God created the beauty and the climax of sex. God created that. And Satan from the very beginning has been perverting it and distorting it because that's what Satan does. Satan cannot create He's not the creator. Satan can only distort and pervert and twist and deform and corrupt what God has created. And he's doing it successfully. Our current culture of sexuality that we see and experience and feel right here, right now, this culture believes the lies that Satan has put forth. Our culture right now is experiencing the frustration and the pain and the, the dissatisfaction and the unhealthiness of human sexuality. The wounds run deep. We see it, we feel it, it's all around us. And it's not just in the culture out there, it's, it's in the church, it's in our lives, it's impacting us deeply. 
John and Stacy Eldridge, they wrote a book and it was called Love and War. That's what it's called. It wasn't, it was, it is. It's called Love and War. And this book is one I've referred to through the years. I think it's a great book on marriage and relationships. And in the book, they're pretty open and raw and honest about their sexual relationship, what that was like for them. Because for John, he was introduced to pornography when he was in the third grade. And that exposure to him had a profound impact on his heart and his mind. Stacy was sexually abused when she was young. She was raped when she was 20 years old. And they just talked about how they brought these broken parts of themselves into their relationship where there was some hurt and some wounds and some struggle and misunderstandings. And they had to they had to heal from the past in order to grab onto the future that God had for them. And they just talk about that journey for them in their relationship, that they, they, had to, they struggled with that. They both experienced abortion in their lives. They both had that prostitute. So when they came to know Jesus, the one who seeks and saves the lost, the one who restores and heals what is broken, that's been the journey of their relationship. It's been one of, of stepping into God's healing for them. Letting Jesus renew their heart and their mind in this area so they could become intimate as a husband and a wife. They could experience the joy that God wanted them to experience. He can help them through those hurts. Not only did John and Stacy need that, we need that. Every one of us needs that. We need God to restore and to redeem and to bring healing to these areas of our relationships. And so what I want to do for a few minutes is I just want to talk about this hyper-sexualized culture that we live in right now. And maybe some of you are going to be like, yeah, it's obvious, but I, I want to actually look specifically at the effects that that's having on people's lives. And a lot of the statistics I'm going to share today, many of them come from a book by Ben Stewart that's, that's called uh, uh, in dating in, or single dating engaged married. That's the name of his book. And so a lot of the, the resources I'm citing today came from that. But I just want to talk about the effects that, that is happening all around us and it's affecting our families, it's affecting our, uh, our, us and our children. Number one, here's the effects of being in a hyper-sexualized culture like we live in right now. Number one, we know this, it damages children. It damages children. For years now, the American Psychological Association has raised alarms about the sexualization of young girls. TV shows, music marketed to adolescents with increasingly sexual acts being depicted. Lingerie now being marketed to girls who are 10 to 13 years of age. Studies are showing that this exposure is leading girls to experience sex at an earlier age. Not only that, but they're now struggling with weight issues, body image issues, the list goes on and on. As young girls, they're, they're watching their star role models wearing lingerie on the stage and, and striking overtly sexual poses in media. And these young girls are, are presented when they see that really with two choices. Here's the two choices they're presented with. Either be overtly sexual or be invisible. And when you think about that from, from an adolescent's perspective, when their greatest desire, their greatest need is, is to be seen, to be known, to be valued, to be loved, they so desire that. What is happening in our culture is telling them either you're, you're going to be invisible or you need to be overtly sexual. And that's what's happening again and again, over and over again. I've actually talked to young men who say they're frustrated when they enter into relationships with girls who immediately are per pushing this on them. And they're like, man, I, I'm struggling with that. I need a little more accountability in that area of my life but it's because this is what they think they need to be. This is the culture they've been raised in. What kind of choice is that for them? And one of the key reasons for that, that these young girls feel pressured and influenced so heavily to be that is because of the porn culture that they're growing in, up in right now in this country. The number of young people who have been exposed to pornography in their adolescent years is in the high 90s. That is the world we live in. In 2011, we're talking several years ago, a book that was entitled Premarital Sex in America, it referred to one of the most reliable studies 
on porn use in 18 to 26 year olds. And the survey indicated this. It said that 86% of young men reported interacting with porn at least once a month. 86%. 69% of young women said that they had no porn use at all. This is back in 2011. But that meant that 31% of young women did. So based on that statistic, going back to 2011, we all know how much worse it's, it's getting uh, day by day. That meant at that time, one in three young women and nine in 10 young men were experiencing pornography. And I want you to think about the, the effect of that on our children, on our young people. Porn sites receive more visitors every single month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. Young people are often exposed to these images, these graphic images that over time become more and more violent by nature. At first, they're repulsed by it, but at the same time, there's this fascination. Sex is very interesting, and so they're fascinated by it, and there's an appeal, an allure to it that draws them, and their young hearts are not processing all of this. It's affecting their minds in significant ways, and therefore, it's affecting our culture in significant ways. The high definition of the multimedia experience of pornography today is addictive. It is addictive. That is why uh, here recently, when you heard about, well, some of you, if you're watching news, you, know, you, you, got, you heard the news about Kanye West uh, becoming a Christian, coming to faith, putting out this Christian album and all the reports on that. Well, in the interviews that people had given him, here's one of the things he said. He said this. He said, Playboy was my gateway into a full-on pornography addiction. He said, my dad left a Playboy out when I was five years old. And here's what he said. It's affected almost every choice I made for the rest of my life, from age five until now, having to kick the habit. And when you look at what he produced, you look at what he came up with, you can see why pornography played a significant role in that. He says, says, it just presents itself in the open like it's okay. And he says, and now I stand up and say it's not okay. It's one of the reasons why when he was producing his new album, he was requiring everybody who was working on it, he, he was requiring them not to engage in premarital sex. He wanted them set apart. He wanted them doing something for God in, in a hyper-sexualized culture where, that he was affected by from a very young age. This distorted lie that's in our culture that Satan promotes that says, hey, you know, it's free. You know, it's, it's, it's about freedom and, and letting loose. It's destroying people. And that hypersexualized culture is affecting our children significantly. A nationwide survey that was conducted by the University of New Hampshire, it indicated that one in six boys and one in four girls are sexually abused by the time they get to 18. And that's just the cases we know. I mean, that's, that's just the cases we, we, we're aware of. Our hypersexualized culture, it is damaging our children. It's damaging relationships. It is making relationships so much more complicated. And it is not just in the culture out there somewhere. It's in the church. It's in our homes. It's in our lives. Let me also just say this. I just want to go through the list of the effects of this. And I know it feels negative, but it divides marriages. It divides marriages. It is now reported Um, This was reported by the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers that 56% of divorce cases involve one party having an obsessive interest in online pornography. That was not the case that many years ago. Uh, Online pornography was not the leading cause of divorce in America, but now it's, it's a high cause of divorce in this country. It's dividing marriages. It's destroying I can also say this about a hypersexualized culture. It disrupts courtship. This is an area of frustration for our young people right now. Donna Friedis, who's a research professor at Notre Dame, she conducted a 10-year nationwide research project on sexuality on college campuses. And in that 10 years of research, she said 100% of people that were researched said their peers have a very casual approach to sex. And of those researched, one in three said that their peers were way too casual about sex. And 41% said hooking up made them feel profoundly unhappy, 
disrespected, sad, or abused. Not one student said that hooking up with someone actually brought them joy and fulfillment, that it was awesome or amazing. That's not what they're saying. In fact, what they became increasingly frustrated about is they just wanted to date. They just wanted to get to know someone. What they longed for was an emotional connection without feeling like they had to give themselves sexually to someone else. But they said, that's just not how the culture works. No one's doing that. That was their feelings in the research. The hookup culture actually denied them from having an emotional connection. And so in that hookup culture, what was happening is when a young man takes a young girl out on a date, and it doesn't have to be a young man, it could be whoever, but takes them out on a date and is buying dinner and buying some popcorn and paying for the movie, there was a pressure among many of these girls that they had to put out or give something sexually in return, which in their own heart, rightfully so, felt like prostitution. But that's the culture. That was the need, which is why a lot of them, when they would start dating, would go Dutch, insisted they go Dutch. Not so much because they wanted to pay, but because they didn't want to feel like they owed something in return. This is what a hyper-sexualized culture looks like, and it's not fun. Courtship and dating is also now being disrupted by cohabitation. It actually disrupts the process of getting to know someone. So many couples today are now cohabitating because it's a test to see, are we compatible? Do we work as roommates? Do we work as sexual partners? Could we do married life together? That's the thought. That's the approach. But here's the problem with that. Only one in five cohabitation relationships actually lead to marriage. Which means in cohabitation, you have one relationship after another relationship after another relationship that fails, that doesn't work. And yet they have been bonded emotionally and sexually in those relationships and it's leading to intimacy impairment. It's leading to to training themselves for an unhealthy relationship. And that's evident because if only one in five actually make it to marriage, of the one in five that do, 85% of them are divorced within 10 years. That's what cohabitation is producing. This is the distorted view that Satan is giving to our culture, saying this is what it means to be free and to enjoy life. This is what it looks like. It's not working. It is destructive. It's hurtful. It leads to regret and wounds. It's painful. There's relational baggage. Because of that, we know that our culture right now, our Hypersexualized culture is also, it's depressing women. It's not that it's not depressing men, but we see depression in women significantly on the rise because of it. Promiscuity, according to research, leads to higher depression rates in women. Women with two or more sexual partners in their lifetime revealed poorer emotional health than women with zero. Now, that didn't mean that you have to stay single in your life to be happy. It's not what the research was showing as you kept reading through it. But it was saying that, that when sex is a part of every relationship that you're a part of, even if you're in a committed relationship at the, at the time, serial monogamy, you're committed to here, but sexually involved, committed here, but sexually involved, that it, it leads to hurt in women much greater than it does for men. Here's another irony about our current culture. Our hypersexualized culture is actually destroying fulfilling sex. It's on the decline, not on the rise. The people who have the most fulfilling sex are those who are in a committed married relationship between a man and a woman, the way God designed it. But that's not where culture is going. And because of that, we see an increase in the church as well that's not going God's way. We're compromising Because the culture message of sex in our world says this. Number one, sex is casual. It's not that big of a deal. You know, everybody's doing it. It's just biology. You know, sex is casual. It's all right. But at the same time, sex is also, I mean, our culture is saying that sex is essential. That you have to have it. That if you don't, it's going to mess you up. I mean, you've got to have that release somehow, and so it's essential. Believe me, I know that argument. Even when I was in college, which was a long time ago, 90 to 94, that was like a long time ago. Even when I was in college, when you have a girlfriend in college like I had, her name was Kim Conover, now Bushnell, mm, yes. <laughs> anyway, I had a girlfriend in college, and we both 
were following the Lord, pursuing the Lord, and we, we were choosing to save sex from marriage. It doesn't take long among your friends and your peers in college and your teammates and other people to learn that, to know that. And so believe me, I, I had several nicknames, a couple of which I cannot repeat. I don't want to repeat right now. That would not be good. But these were nicknames teammates gave me, nicknames because I was saving sex for marriage, uh, teasing me, giving me a hard time. You know, the joke was, you know, I could explode at any moment, stay away, you know, get away from Wayne. He could explode at any second. Why? Because it's essential. You have to. That's our culture. So it takes a casual view. It's no big deal. But at the same time, it says it's a huge deal. You got to have it. But then our culture also says this, sex, it's primarily physical. It's just physical. That was the argument of a lot of the, my friends in college. It's just physical. Now, when I, when I get married someday, it won't just be physical, but it's, it's, just, it's just physical. It's just biology. And so we need to loosen up. We need to not hold such religious, repressive views about sex that keep us from having enjoyment and fun. The problem is that argument is so, is so overused and done and been proved wrong. It's not creating fulfillment and enjoyment. The more open we are, the less fulfilling it is. Lust is never satisfied. And that distorted view of sex is prevalent in every culture and I think an example of this, when we come to the New Testament, when you, when you open your Bible, like, for example, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you could go there right now, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you're opening up to a text that was written in the first century to a church in Corinth, to the Corinthians, that had a history of sexual perversion. The temple there was the temple of Aphrodite. It had 1,000 temple prostitutes. That's how you worshiped. If you were a sexual pervert during the first century, People would call you a Corinthian. When Plato referred to a prostitute, he used the expression Corinthian girl. Corinth experienced gender confusion, alternative lifestyles, perversion and promiscuity. STDs were widespread. The rich would throw banquets. And when you showed up to the party, you were given a personal prostitute. These people became Christians. They desperately needed Jesus. They needed forgiven of their sins. They accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They were baptized into Christ, and they came into the church. Do you think suddenly all that baggage was gone, disappeared? Paul's writing to these people because what he saw in the culture, he was seeing in the church. And so Corinthians is written to a culture that was a hyper-sexualized culture, just like ours today. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul was dealing in that section there with some of the excuses that they were saying. Like they would say things like, I have the right to do anything. I have the right to do this. In other words, it's two consenting adults. It's not against the law. We're not breaking any laws here, man. Give us a break. And Paul goes on to tell him, hey, it, it may be permissible by law. But that doesn't mean it's beneficial. Is that what we're going to lower ourselves to? Is that whatever the laws of the land are? They would go on and say, hey, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. You know, what do you do when you got a hunger pain? You got to eat. I mean, what happens if you don't eat? You, you can't survive. You know, sex is the same way. What, what do you do to satisfy your sexual desires? You have sex. Sex is like eating food. It's just satisfying the desire, satisfying the hunger pain. And Paul is looking at that, and he says, satisfying your sexual desires is not the same as satisfying your hunger pain. In fact, Paul says it this way in verses 13, 16, and 18. He says, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality. How does he know that? Because God said it. And God is the creator of it. He says, your body was made for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? They're one. For it is said the two will become one flesh. It doesn't just have to be a prostitute. It's whoever you're united with, you become one flesh with her. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside of his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. This idea that it's casual and no big deal. He's like, do you understand? You become one with a person. It is a cementing glue that bonds you together. It's a deep bond that you experience with one another. This isn't like eating. This is way more powerful than that. 
Giving your body in sex is not, is not the same as sharing a bucket of popcorn. And for us to think that just demonstrates our ignorance. Sex fires off chemicals and hormones in the brain that not only produce pleasure, but creates the chemicals for attachment and bonding. It's, it's the same chemical that is used when a woman is breastfeeding her baby that creates bonding with one another. It is intended for that. Here's what that means. It means sexuality is more than the mashing together of bodies. It is the mingling of personhood. It's becoming one. And when we become one and unite with those who do not belong to us, those who are not our spouse, and we do that over and over, it creates, it, it creates relational damage, always. And the really concerning issue today is that for many young men especially, I cite that because of the high numbers, nine out of 10, the bonding that they're experiencing is not with a real person. It's with a screen. And this is creating a whole nother layer of complication. Because when we become addicted to pornography, which is very easy to do, we become dependent on those explicit imageries to be aroused is what we desire. And when that happens, then we're no longer sensitive to the normal, slow building stimuli like romance or dating. Most often, generally speaking, you know, women are like crock pots. You know, and I, you know, I said that wrong. Yeah, no, I said it right. Women are like crock pots, men are like microwaves. You know, that's, we know that. And when you get into pornography, you, you lose the ability to romance a woman and to woo her and to prepare her. The other thing that we're seeing happening is a growing number of men with erectile dysfunction. Why are we hearing so much about that on every single commercial? Why can I not, I not listen to sport radio with hearing that commercial every time it's on? Because what we have found, according to research and conversations uh, with young men. Ben Stewart said he thought this might be a myth until he started having conversations with young men who were addicted to pornography and he found all of them had erectile dysfunction. That a greater supply of the stimulant equals a diminished capacity. It's less fulfilling. We've given Satan a foothold in our culture, in our families, in our communities, in our churches. It's in our lives. It's not just out there somewhere. It's right in here. And we didn't make our bodies, God did. And he knows what it, what it takes to make it fulfilling and meaningful. And for us to be a good steward of that and what leads to life. And we need to begin addressing this again, talking about it again, confessing it. And so what I want to do really quick, and I'm going to have to do this really fast, so I need to run through this, is I want to give you the blessings of godly sexuality. The blessings of godly sexuality. Here they are, number one. Sex and marriage, it's fulfilling and life-giving. That's how God designed it. Sex and marriage should be fulfilling and life-giving. If it isn't, then this is something that as a married couple you need to address. You need to talk openly about this. I understand that there are reasons why it may not be possible to have fulfilling sex in marriage. Sometimes it can be physically, you can be physically unable. That can be because of health complications. It can be because of pain issues. It can be because of dysfunction. There's a number of reasons that can cause that and lead to that. And I totally understand that. And when that happens, God will sustain you through it. Then there, there, physical intimacy may look a little different when that happens. God can, can bring you through that. But if, if it's not a physical issue that's causing that, you've already tried to get some help over and figure that out, but, but you are not physically intimate in your relationship because... You've stopped having sex either because you, you just don't desire it or because you're not interested or because there's, there's other issues in the relationship that need to be addressed. That needs to be addressed. God gave this to you as a cementing glue to bond you together. And when you have troubles in the bedroom, it typically reflects troubles in the marriage. And when you have troubles in the marriage or troubles, that is not an excuse. Let me just talk to the men for a minute. That is not an excuse for us to sin. That is not an excuse for us to be, become sexual immoral in other ways and use that as an excuse. Well, she just won't or can't. God doesn't give that as a reason. But when we can be intimate and we're just choosing not to, that is an issue that needs to be addressed. Hebrews tells us that we should not give up meeting together. We should not give up that habit of meeting together in the church. Well, Scripture also talks about that in marriage. 
You shouldn't give up the habit of meeting together, coming together in marriage either. Or how about Proverbs 5, 18 through 19 that says, may your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. What that means is you have a right to no one else and no one else has a right to you. May your spouse, your wife, she's the only one that you go to for fulfillment. She is the standard of beauty. You look to her and nowhere else and no one else. May you be intoxicated with her love, not with a computer screen, not with a mobile device, not with someone else who hasn't promised to love you all the days of their life. You be faithful because it's, it's fulfilling. Number two, let me say this. Sex also in marriage should be deeply bonding and intimate. This is how God created it. Now, I understand that the majority of marriages at some point will hit sexual hard times. That happens in every relationship. The question is, how do couples love one another during those times? What do you do? And we don't have time to get into all of that, but let me just say this, that one way, one way to love each other is just to initiate anyway. To kiss, even when you don't feel like kissing. To make love, even when you don't feel like making love. Why? Because that's what God leads us to do as husband and wife in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 through 5, reveal how you should bless one another sexually even when you don't feel like it. It addresses that. You can go there and read it because it's deeply bonding, cementing in your relationship. It's something that's important. So sex and marriage, it should be deeply bonding and intimate. That's where it happens the best. And then number three is this. Abstaining from sex outside of marriage, that is right and honorable and blessed. When you abstain from sex outside of marriage, it is right, it's honorable, and it is blessed by God. I'm just telling you right now that it's, it's happening. Sometimes we just feel like nobody's doing that. I'm here to tell you, I can start giving you names of people right now who are and they're single. It can happen, it is happening. They're waiting. Why? Because of verses like this. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. It's God's will. This is his will for you. That you should be sanctified. That means set apart and holy. That you should avoid sexual immorality. That each of you should learn to control your body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who don't know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Why? Because that's what happens. When you don't save sex for marriage, you, you're, you wrong someone. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. When we're not honoring God with our bodies, we're rejecting him. We're rejecting the Holy Spirit from our life. This is why some of us right now are not experiencing his power in our lives. We're, we're not sexually pure. We're not giving him access and control of our lives. It is time to start fighting for purity. Look, we have resources we can give you as a church. We've got books. We've got websites. We have counselors that we can recommend. We've got people who want to stand with you and encourage you. And it's time that we address it in the church. It's time we do something about this. There's been even one book that's been recommended by a counselor. It was a book called, it's called Finally Free. It's by Heath Lambert. This book, Finally Free, deals with sexual purity in the power of grace and how God in, intends for us to live in him. This is what we're after. This is what we're going for. This is what our church needs desperately. And today is a day where we just have to come to God and say, God, we confess, and God, we need you, and we're desperate for you. And we, God, we repent. We want to turn back. We want to honor you in this area of our lives that affects us so deeply. A culture that, that says, man, don't put, don't put these religious boundaries on this that are, that are you know, containing you. And God is saying, no, I'm here to set you free. Free from the enslavement of a hyper-sexualized culture. Now, you may be wondering today, man, what if I already messed up? Um, dude, I messed this up big time. And I just want you to know, the whole book we were reading from 1 Corinthians was written to people who had messed up. And yet Paul tells them, yeah, that's what you were. I mean, that, that's what happened. But now you're, you're washed. Now you're sanctified. Now you're justified. What was he saying? He's saying, now you're healed. Now you're redeemed. Now you can live a new life. 
God is in the business of washing and renewing people who've been devastated by sin. He doesn't want you to continue in your guilt. He wants you to be set free. That's why Romans 8, 1 says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He can restore you and renew you and heal you. He did it for John and Stacy. He's done it for others. He can do it for you. He can redeem you in this area of your life. So don't think for a moment that you've sinned too much to be cleansed or forgiven or renewed. No, you've never sinned too much. In fact, that's what the Bible teaches, is that God's grace is so far-reaching, his love so expansive. Sometimes we're like, man, it's crazy. I mean, just think of the prodigal son. Here was a boy that said to his dad, I'm out of here. I want away from you. I want as far away from you as I can get. And that's what that prodigal son did. We hear the word prodigal, and when we hear that word, we think wayward. He was a wayward son. The word actually means wasteful. He wasted everything that he had. He wasted it on living the life. His brother even said prostitutes. He wasted it. But there came that moment when he came to his senses and he looked up and he said, what am I doing? And he turned, he went back to the father and the father was waiting with, with him with open arms. And he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him. He lavished him with his love and his affection and his grace. And he brought him back into the family. And an older brother in the home looked at his dad and said, what a prodigal father. What a wasteful father to waste such love and affection and grace on somebody who doesn't deserve it. And that's what religious people in the church could sometimes do. Man, they don't deserve that kind of a wasteful love of God. But Jesus tells us this story to say our God's love is so lavish on us. His grace is so sufficient for us. He covers our sins. He heals us. He renews us. He's a prodigal father. His love is reckless. His grace is so wide. It blows your mind. Don't think for a minute that our God isn't so grace-filled that he couldn't redeem you and save you. So I want you to stand to your feet because we're going to sing about this love of God. And I want to pray that this would be a moment where we, we confess our sins and we turn to our God. I'm going to be stepping out these side doors right here and as we sing, I'd love to visit with you and pray with you. Let's pray for purity in our relationships, in our lives. Let's pray for our children. Let's pray for our families. Let's pray for our friends. Let's ask God to heal us and to renew us and to restore us as we sing. I'll meet you right over here.